Okay, so here's our first question. And we're gonna look at the first question and then uh, I'm gonna jump to the tab information and we'll go through that for a second. And then we'll come back and actually start really trying to answer this question. So the first question is, uh, how many drinking fountains are required in the building design? Assume that the building is 40,000 square feet gross area. Well, right away you realize, wait, I don't even know what we're talking about here. I need to go look at the information that they've sent so that we can figure out what to do next. So let's take a look at that. We'll run through uh, some, some of the information. Now it's gonna be a little awkward, so just bear with me as I jump back and forth on the screens and uh, apologies uh, on my end of not being so great at uh, doing, making that uh, smooth and easy. But uh, here's the table of contents. So this is effectively our, our uh, tabs, if you imagine the tabs across the top of a, of a computer screen. So we've got uh, the scenario, we've got a program uh, in this case, uh, we have a phase one environmental report, we've got a climate analysis, we've got the zoning code, we have a zoning map, we have an aerial photo, and then we have excerpts from the IBC, the building code, the International Building Code. Uh, so probably the first thing to do is take a look and read the scenario. So we're gonna take a quick look at that. Uh, and I'm just gonna read it out real quick. Uh, scenario, you are the architect for a new office building for a small to mid-sized business. It is a new technology company called Jumpster. The, that uh, business has needs that will be obvious, things like uh, administration, financial departments, marketing, stuff like that, and some less obvious, prototyping like. The client has some specific ideas about how the work uh, place should operate, and why, what it should feel like, and how people should be communicating with each other. Essentially, what the experience should be like to work there. But there are certain realities that we must deal with as well, such as uh, land use, zoning issues, contaminants, uh, a whole series of those other things, and that's essentially what's represented in a number of these different uh, tabs. Uh, then there are a few questions that cover issues. Um, uh, uh, there are a few questions that uh, cover issues covered by all of the supporting documents. Some issues may be answerable by just reviewing one document. Others may have to be interpolated between multiple pieces of information from multiple sources. So that's the general scenario. Uh, then we can take a look at the program. So the program means that it's the information that's come from uh, the client as part of the signing of the uh, 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 contract. Now, these are sort of simple versions of things, so this is actually a relatively simple uh, uh, program, but you'll see that it has that general information, and it's got some goals, uh, and then uh, as we go down, it's got, uh, oop, I zoomed by it, hang on a second here. Um, yeah, let me try doing it this way. No, that's taking me on the tabs. Um, it's got some information about the number of employees. Uh, it's got some information about how much square footage is expected for each of the uh, different departments. Uh, and then it's got some conclusions, a uh, sort of general uh, problem statement for the, for the project. And then after we take a look at that program, we can see we have an environmental phase one. Uh, and so the phase one is just that preliminary, it's a few pages long, it's uh, probably not gonna do a big long discussion about the difference between phase one and phase two right now, but the idea is that phase one is where you go in and say, uh, there's a site, we're not really sure if there's any issues, we get some professionals, environmental uh, engineers and, and environmental scientists. Uh, they take a look through the information about the site. They look at the site, uh, maybe through photos, maybe in person, but often not, uh, and just uh, look at the history of the site and come up with whether there's likely to be any uh, problems here. So this is an environmental phase one. Uh, if things are problematic, then you would probably get an environmental phase two where all the actual testing happens. So we've got the environmental phase one uh, about the site. And it has, this is essentially the executive summary of the phase one. An actual phase one would be about 100 pages long, but the executive summary is just a couple pages. So there's the 
phase one. Uh, now we have a climate analysis and environmental proposals. Uh, and so this is just giving you a sense, you know, we've got some information here about the climate. It's a temperate climate. It's at 40 degrees latitude. It talks about uh, being a relatively cold uh, winter, um, reasonably warm but not super hot average summer. Uh, a little bit of information about the site and then a series of proposals uh, down at the end of that page that are regarding climate analysis and environmental um, aspects to the project. So you can see under the proposals, uh, daylight capture, maybe geothermal, uh, controlled cross-ventilation opportunities, whole series of different uh, things along those lines. Then we have a portion of the zoning code and this is multiple pages. Um, and so it's going to have FAR information, uh, setback information, parking information, a whole series of, of different uh, aspects of that. Uh, so that's multiple pages. And then there's going to be the uh, zoning map. Uh, and on the zoning map, you can see we have the site called out. It's a B3-3. Uh, and importantly, you notice a couple of other things. There's an element here called a pedestrian street. Um, different municipalities will have different ways that they talk about these things, but they're specialized streets uh, that, uh, where the municipality wants to emphasize uh, and make sure that they don't accidentally make really dead streets. This wants to be a relatively lively streets, street with lots of uh, uh, windows facing to the, to the main street. So that's a pedestrian street. And you also note that uh, very close by there's a train station, transit station. And then there's a aerial photo just to give you a sense of it. There's the site. You can see the transit station. There's an open site just to the south, uh, uh, southeast. Um, uh, so there's some opportunities here. Uh, you can tell there's residential nearby, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then the final piece of information we have is um, the excerpt from the building code. Now, we haven't put the whole thing in, but it's actually a lot of pages even with just this. Uh, so you can see we have the use and occupancy classification, we have the general building heights and areas, we have types of construction, we have uh, chapter 10, the means of egress, and then chapter 29, plumbing systems. Uh, so there's a lot of information uh, in that uh, IBC uh, section. We have a general idea of what's going on. Uh, we've looked at the site, so we have a sense of kind of what generally is happening. Uh, we understand by looking at the uh, zoning map uh, that it's a B, B3-3, uh, that there's residential nearby, that it's on a pedestrian street, which is a special classification, and it's near a transit. Uh, we uh, can look at the zoning code and start understanding. Uh, we have the floor area ratio, uh, the FAR here. Um, you can see we also, at the bottom of that sheet, we have the front setbacks. Uh, and then the rear setbacks. We've got uh, some building height information. Uh, we have the parking uh, table that tells us how many parking spaces we're going to need. So we've got a series of pieces of information there that are going to be useful. Uh, the climate analysis and the program. Let's look back uh, at the program for a moment just before we jump back into the questions. Uh, so taking a quick look, uh, we can see that we've got um, some general goals. We want a high performance building. Uh, we want uh, efficient groupings for the office and the departments. We want natural light for all down there, number 12. Um, everyone is near the exterior, number 13. So there's a bunch of information in there. And if we had a minute, we'd probably read through that whole thing. I'm going to kind of skip along for now. And then on page two of the program, it talks about how the site is 20,000 square feet. We have 170 feet of street frontage along the main pedestrian street that we were just looking at on the, that uh, zoning map. Uh, and then we have all of those uh, uh, folks. We have the number of people listed out per um, department. And it comes out to uh, about 220 
Now that might change, uh, but it's going to be approximately that. But then we're adding in 20% for growth, so that's another, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that should be 200, I believe. Uh, I think that was a typo there. Uh, so then that uh, comes out with the growth added in to 240 employees. And then the uh, number of square foot per department, we'll see if that becomes useful or not. Okay, so we're gonna jump back to the actual questions and we're gonna take a look and see, go remind ourselves what the first question is. How many drinking fountains are required in the building design? So we're assuming that the building is 40,000 square feet. Uh, we're assuming that from the program, if we looked through, there'd be uh, some information that says this is what we're aiming towards. So then we have possible answers, one drinking fountain, four drinking fountains, there are no requirements for drinking fountains in business occupancies, 2.5 rounded up to three drinking fountains. Well, one thing I can definitely tell you is it's not C, um, because drinking fountains almost always are in fact required in business occupancies. Uh, it's a thing that's important to folks um, in, it's just one of those things that shows up all the time in pretty much every code. Uh, so, we got to figure out how many drinking fountains are needed. So, first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at uh, the IBC, and we note that the plumbing chapter is way down at the end, uh, and so I'm going to zoom as fast as I can to the end. It's going to take a second, so give me just a minute. We need some music is there for you. A way I can get rid of that thing so I can get to that. Uh, no. Okay, here it is. Okay. We need some scrolling music. Yeah, we do need scrolling music. That would be nice. So you can see we're going through all of that egress stuff and all, all the way along here. Um, okay. We get uh, pretty close here to the main plumbing information. Okay, here we are in the plumbing section. Uh, we take a look down here. We've got a table, minimum number of required plumbing fixtures. Uh, you can see they have uh, for different classifications. So they have the classifications called out uh, over here. Uh, and then uh, water closets, uh, lavatories, showers, and drinking fountains. So that's the one that we're really looking for. So See if we can find, uh, let me do it this way. We're in the A's, those are assemblies. We're still in the assemblies, there's business. So we've got business right here. Here's the drinking fountain line and it says one per 100 people. So then an interesting question is, well, how many people do we have? And the answer we just looked at in the program is we have, if, even if we include the growth, 240 people. But is that the actual right number? And the problem here is it's one thing for our client to want to have 240 people there, but that isn't necessarily what we would use for the calculation on this because we actually need to have it be something that matches, like let's say this company goes out of business next week and a different uh, a company moves into the building and they have a different number of people, the, the number of drinking fountains, the number of bathrooms, the number of uh, water closets, all that stuff has to work for whoever moves into the building. So the scale of the building and the occupancy, those two pieces of information are the thing that we would actually really need to think about. So we have to know in a business, so this is the occupancy is business, in a business environment, how many people does the code think are in this building? Not how many people does our client imagine putting into them, but how many people does the code think? And that's gonna be a per square foot uh, way of understanding it. And so that's actually gonna be in a totally different section. We're gonna be in the section that is about uh, egress uh, because that's where they're gonna define that, where they're gonna define the occupancy count. So now I'm gonna go zooming way back up uh, all the way through that code. And when we're in that section, 
here we are, uh, table, in this case, 1004.1.2 is the maximum floor area allowances per occupant. Uh, so the first bunch of those are all regarding like uh, aircrafts and a bunch of other stuff. So we need to go to the next page. And we're looking through the next page and we see business and it says 100 gross. So 100 square feet of uh, gross area per, uh, per person. Well, we talked about how the building was 40,000 square feet. Uh, we divide that by 100, means we have uh, 400, not the 240 that we were thinking, but 400 people uh, occupying this building according to the code. Now, there are actually a bunch of ways you can start to alter that number. There are some exceptions here and other things there, but for the most part, uh, you're going to find that that's going to be a pretty straightforward thing. So our actual number is going to be 400 people, and it was one per 100. So therefore, B is our correct answer. And there's a couple questions here. Yeah. <clears throat> Folks are asking about the search tool. Um, so there is a search tool. Um, and actually, if you use, so we built um, at Black Spectacles, we built our practice exams with the exact same tools that um, NCARB has on the real exam. Uh, and it looks the same and everything else. So it's like we tried to sort of replicate it as closely exactly, as we yeah. could. Um, and so if you use our practice exams, you'll get a sense of how it works. Um, and, and a sense of how to use the search tool. But there is a search tool yeah. that allows you to search. So there's pretty good tabbing and a search tool and a bunch of other, it's just in this context, it's, we have to kind of scroll through everything. So apologies about that. So thanks that. Carla and Philip for, uh, for yeah. those questions.